Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. This is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry. Brought to you by... Alone, the life of Paul. Redfield Arts Audio is thrilled to announce that our epic audio biography of Edgar Allan Poe, featuring a full cast, full musical score, and sound effects, will go into full production in 2019. Over the coming weeks, we will begin to announce the stellar cast for Alone, The Life of Poe, the voices that will bring the world and life of the great writer, poet, and critic to life. Our campaign launches on Poe's birthday, January 19th, 2019. Join us and let's bring Poe to life. With this episode of the Redfield Arts Review, we take you back in time. Back in time to Poe's birthplace, Boston, Massachusetts. But our time machine won't take us quite back to the year of Poe's birth, 1809, but to the year 2014, when Poe finally returned to Boston in the form of Stephanie Rocknack statue. So how exactly did the city of Boston, Poe's birthplace, get their act together to honor their native son? It all started, really, around 2009, when an undergraduate student at Boston College, Catherine Kim, asked her professor, Paul Lewis, a simple question. Why isn't Boston doing anything for the Poe Bicentennial? After all, he was born here. And so, a modest event marking the Poe Bicentennial was created, and from that, one event led to another. The mayor of Boston declared a triangle of space at Boylston and Charles Edgar Allan Poe Square. The Edgar Allan Poe Foundation of Boston was created to, among other things, create a public art statue for Poe Square that would honor Poe and finally bring Poe home, where he had been missing for so many years. On October 5, 2014, the public art statue, Poe Returning to Boston, was unveiled at Edgar Allan Poe Square, the corner of Boylston Street and Charles Street South in Boston. Artist Stephanie Rocknack designed the life-size statue of the writer. Its funding and installation were overseen by the Edgar Allan Poe Foundation of Boston in honor of the writer's birth in Boston on January 19, 1809. Fundraising for the project was completed in March 2014. Poe Square, where the statue was placed and now lives, was dedicated by the late Mayor Thomas M. Menino in 2009. Chosen in 2012, from among 265 proposals, Stephanie Rockneck's sculpture shows Poe walking towards the house his parents, Eliza and David, were living in around the time he was born. We take you now to the dedication ceremonies in Boston that occurred on an unseasonably warm and beautiful day, October 5th, 2014. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Poe Foundation of Boston, the Brown Trust Fund, and the Boston Art Commission, I'm pleased to welcome you to the celebration of Stephanie Rocknack's sculpture, Poe Returning to Boston. Uh, I'm Andrea Shea, the arts and culture reporter for WBUR, and I've been following this project's journey since it was a twinkling in the eyes of the orchestrators behind it. And it just did my heart really good to see the New York Times article this morning. Wonderful. Post Studies Association. I would like to thank Paul Lewis, chair of the Edgar Allan Poe Foundation of Boston and the Edgar Allan Poe Foundation of Boston itself for making this day and its historic events possible. Stephanie Rocknack, our sculptor, for her artistic vision and the magnificent product of her labors, Poe Returning to Boston, a work of art that will speak to the generations. And especially today, the city and people of Boston for supporting this project long overdue that properly and engagingly honors Edgar Allan Poe in the city of his birth. As a literary critic, Poe had a contentious relationship with Boston, or rather with the didacticism he associated with Boston's most celebrated literati, whose aesthetic practices stood in opposition to his own conviction that poetry is the rhythmical creation of beauty, 
and that beauty, not truth, is the sole legitimate province of poetry. His often caustic exchanges in print with New England's journalists and poets did little to endear him to the Boston public. Today, with the dedication of this statue, we reflect on Poe's many positive connections to this city, the accolades received by his grandmother Elizabeth Arnold and his mother Eliza on the Boston stage, Poe's birth in Boston on January 19, 1809, his return to Boston to become a poet with the publication of his first book, Tamerlane and Other Poems by a Bostonian, 1827, his critical and literary contributions to Boston periodicals, and his enduring legacy of originality in American letters, and his development of an, of an aesthetic honed in Boston that would anticipate the art for art's sake movement. And we look ahead today to the role that Boston will play in preserving Poe's memory and will play in preserving Poe's memory and conveying Poe's story to future generations. Today, Boston joins the ranks of other cities, Baltimore, Richmond, Philadelphia, New York, and Sullivan's Island, that claim Poe as their own and honor his genius. As those of us today who are gathered here from across the country and indeed around the world recognize, Poe does not belong to a single city. Though Boston was the city his mother Eliza commended to him ever to love, the place where she found her best, most sympathetic friends, and the place where Poe himself sought first to be a poet. Nor does Poe belong to a single nation, though he's arguably the most widely known and universally appreciated of our American authors. Rather, the Telltale Poe Heart is one of Poe's most Poe famous tales. It was first published in Boston in January 1843 in The Pioneer. Nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been, and I am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all, the sense of hearing acute. I heard all the things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Listen, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. 
but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into his chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in the bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no, it was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him. Though I chuckled at heart, I knew that he had been lying awake ever since that first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, It is merely a cricket, which has made a single chirp. Yes. He had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot from out the crevice and full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless, 
I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am, and now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now, a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once. Once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, (laughs) not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. (laughs) When I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search. Search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted familiar things. But ere long I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale. But I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observation of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men and chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard it not? 
Almighty God. No, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. 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 Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. Please come back again for our next show. The Redfield Arts Review and the original content of this program is copyright the Mark Redfield Company. Shopping for explosives by Coconut Monkey Rocket. Licensed under Attribution Non-Commercial International License. All other content used by permission of the respective rights holders or used for educational and informational purposes. Original music, sound design, and engineering is by Jennifer Rouse. This is your announcer, Marianne Perry. Alone, the life of Poe. Redfield Arts Audio is thrilled to announce that our epic audio biography of Edgar Allan Poe, featuring a full cast, full musical score, and sound effects, will go into full production in 2019. Over the coming weeks, we will begin to announce the stellar cast for Alone, The Life of Poe. The voices that will bring the world and life of the great writer, poet, and critic to life. Our campaign launches on Poe's birthday, January 19, 2019. Join us and let's bring Poe to life. From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not awaken my heart to joy of the same tone. And all I loved, I loved alone.